Welcome, everybody. Hope you've had a good conference so far. I have. Um, it's been a lot of fun. My name is Spencer Christensen, and I am local, uh, born and raised here in Salt Lake. Um, well, Salt Lake, a little north of here. Um, I've been doing web development in some form or another since 98, 99, around that time. Um, I've worked for a couple different companies. I worked for backcountry.com for quite a while. I worked for Skull Candy um, for quite a while. Um, I'm currently employed uh, with a company called Endpoint Corporation. They're based in New York City and I work remotely uh, doing consulting for a variety of clients. Um, some web development, some system administration, some database administration, uh, a variety of things. Uh, so that's me. Um, I've been using Git for uh, quite a while, probably since 2008, 2009. Um, so that's kind of my background. Uh, let's talk about workflows. Uh, well, actually, before we get into that, let, let, let's take a journey back in time. Let's, let's talk about something that happened a long time ago in the history of the Internet. So way, way, way back in 2010, there was a significant blog post um, that, uh, that introduced something that a lot of people found interesting. A lot of people gravitated and talked about. Um, it introduced a workflow, a structured workflow of how to use Git and, and said that this was a successful thing that uh, that worked for this person and and explained it in very good detail um, and maybe some of you have heard of this or have seen this blog post called Gitflow. So uh, this created quite a buzz and a lot of people started talking about this and a lot of people started adopting it saying hey this makes a lot of sense this is logical well thought out it's successful and there were a lot of people that embraced it full-heartedly and said this is the way to do it. Um, however, I think when a lot of people did that, they also shunned anyone who wasn't doing Git flow, thinking maybe they're just not as mature or they're not uh, as, uh, I don't know, they're not at the same level. They're not getting it. Um, so I start with this little bit of history, not necessarily to talk about Git flow itself. We'll get to that later. What I want to start with is actually the void that this filled. So clearly there was something that wasn't there before, and this kind of filled that. Otherwise, people, you know, people really gravitated to it and talked about it and embraced it. So there was something about it that caused that kind of um, excitement. Um, it questioned how people were currently using Git, and it provided an example that was successful for someone, saying this is a good way to do it. And a lot of people maybe didn't have strong opinions or didn't have much confidence in their workflow, and therefore they saw someone who did have confidence and an opinion, and, and so they kind of gravitated towards that and said, hey, um, let's support this. So in today's talk, I'm not necessarily going to talk about the way to do it. Um, um, I'm going to talk about instead, maybe, well, let's first start, start talking about why. I'm going to talk about the purpose of our workflow. So, is anyone familiar with this phrase up here at the top? It stands for, there is more than one way to do it. You can also pronounce it Tim Toady. Um, so to give an example of, of this principle is a story called Stephanie's Ponytail. Is anyone here familiar with this story, this book? It's a children's story, but it's awesome. So I have three kids. Uh, we read this all the time. So I'll give you the, the summary. Um, there's a young girl named Stephanie, and she goes to her mom and says, none of the other kids in my school have ponytails. I would like a ponytail. 
a nice one just coming out the back. So her mom gave her a nice ponytail. And the next day she goes to school and all the kids look at her and say, ugly, ugly, very ugly, what are you doing? And she said, it's my ponytail and I like it. So the next day she comes again with the ponytail and all the other kids, all the other girls have ponytails like her. And she's like, what are you doing? You're just copying me. So she goes home the next day and her mom says, do you want a nice ponytail? And, or do you want a ponytail coming out the back? Stephanie says, no. And her mom says, well, that's that. That's the only place you can do a ponytail. And Stephanie says, no, it's not. I want one coming out the side, right above my ear. And her mom says, are you sure that's what you want? That's very strange. And Stephanie said, yeah, why not? And so her mom gave her a nice ponytail coming out the side above her ear. So she goes to school. All the other kids are saying, ugly, ugly, very ugly. What are you doing? And she said, it's my ponytail and I like it. And so the next day she comes to school and all the kids have ponytails coming out the side above her ear, above their ear. And she's like, you're just a bunch of copycats. What are you doing? Think for yourselves. And so the next day her mom says, Stephanie, would you like a ponytail coming out the back? No. Do you want one coming out the side? No. She's like, well, that's that. That's the only place you can do a ponytail. And she's like, no, it's not. I want one coming out the top like a tree right out of my head. And she's like, are you sure? That's really strange. She said, yeah, why not? So her mom gives her a nice ponytail coming right out the top. And she goes to school. And all the kids, again, ugly, ugly, very ugly. What are you doing? Anyway, she freaks out. Said, and the kids, again, the next day, copy her, do the same thing. And she said, this is it. I can't take Tomorrow, I'm going to have shaved my head. So the next day, the first person to come to class is the teacher, and she's shaved her head. <laughs> and then the next to come are the boys, and they've all shaved their head. And then the next to come are the girls in the class, and they've all shaved their head. And the last one to come is Stephanie, and she had a nice ponytail coming out the back. <laughs> so it, it, it's a humorous story, and I really like it. Um, so I hope it gives the point of what I'm trying to get here, that there is more than one way to do it, and it's okay. So the purpose of a workflow, Git workflow, um, let's, let's maybe talk, let's clarify that. A purpose of a software development workflow using Git. Why, what purpose does it serve? Yes. So it helps establish a, a workflow for you to develop, release, deploy, maintain software. Beyond that, it also, well, let, let's back up. But thank you. Um, let, let, let's maybe take a step back and think, what's the purpose of software in general? I mean, this can give us more insight to fill out that answer a little more. Okay, I think um, I think you're you're on the right track. I I really like the answer from from Max here in Code Simplicity. The purpose of software, at a very general level, is to help people. We write software for a lot of different things, a lot of different tools, a lot of systems. Uh, we write them for cars. We write them for uh, other servers, for networks. We write them for telephones. We write them for satellites. But ultimately, those things are to help people. We write software for plants and animals, but really that software is to help the people who work with those things. And I think this gives us a clue as to maybe what in informs the purpose of our Git workflow should be. It's really to help the people to release, to develop and release software. It's not necessarily to help the Jenkins server or to help the, the build release process is to help the people, okay? So when we talk about um, who, who is involved in this, um, 
the people that are involved. It's the people that are responsible for that software. And that encompasses more than just developers. So people that are, in, are responsible for that software are also the operations team, are also project managers and business owners ultimately are the people that are responsible for that. It's their offering, their service, their product. Um, and so our workflow actually impacts them. How we do this, how we work through building and releasing and maintaining and owning this software. So does your Git workflow actually help these people? Um, we're going to go through some examples, and you can kind of think about that as we go through. So GitHub, I'm not necessarily going to talk about how you and I work with GitHub. I'm going to talk about how GitHub builds and develops GitHub, how, their internal workflow. And this is a diagram which shows how they do it. Everything is off of master. Everyone develops a new feature, a new branch, comes off of master, um, and emerges back in eventually. Um, master is what gets deployed to production. And anything that's in master needs to be production worthy. Everything they work on, they work on locally, commit to their own local branch. That local branch gets pushed to origin so that they can do pull requests with peers, and they can pull down that branch and review it, do code review. Once it gives the approval and the thumbs up, then that same developer will merge into master and deploy. That's it. Um, it's, it's an extremely simple workflow. Um, one of the pros is that bringing on new engineers, new hires, they don't have a lot to learn. I mean, I just explained it in less than five minutes. So you can get a new developer up and running and working and possibly deploying it to production the same day. Um, there's a really low barrier to, to working with this workflow. Um, some of the cons is you, we're going to be probably introducing a lot of branches. The more engineers you have, the, the more you scale, the more branches you're going to have, which means the more merges you're going to have. And more merges introduces more risk for merge conflicts, for, for, the, for problems to occur. So at a large scale, I don't think this works that well. Um, the, this workflow is designed for, um, for software where the release itself isn't significant. They release many times a day. So an actual individual release, the 10 a.m. release on Tuesday, doesn't necessarily mean much because they're going to release again three hours later. Um, and, and so a release version doesn't really make sense. So this is also implies that they don't necessarily version every single release. It, it doesn't really make sense to them. This kind of workflow is something that, um, and also the end user, doesn't care about which version of the software they're running. If you're looking at a website, a web application, you don't necessarily know if it's, you know, what specific version of that site you're on right now because it's going to change. So they don't necessarily. Um, that's not that's nothing that the workflow itself matters. They don't necessarily care. Um, so that's something to consider. I, I worked at a company called Skull Candy, as I mentioned, um, and I helped to design their workflow um, while I was there. I was their uh, system architect, and I based what are the Skull Candy workflow off of GitHub. I thought that was a, a pretty smart and simple and streamlined way to do it. So we have master in the same way. Everything that's in master is uh, releasable, is, is uh, production worthy. Um, but we worked in a, in a slightly different, well, I don't know, different. I, I don't necessarily know 
uh, GitHub's internal uh, methodology, but we use Scrum at Skull Candy, and we use two-week sprints of work. And so it was very predictable to say at the end of that sprint, we would have a bunch of code that was, pr that was demoed and accepted and ready for release. It was pretty regular. Um, and so we weren't necessarily releasing many times a day. We were releasing basically at the end of every sprint. Um, we also relied heavily on our uh, ticket system. We, had, we used Rally at this place, and, but whatever ticket tracking system, ticket tracking system you use, uh, will have some sort of identifier with every um, ticket, with every request. So we had user stories in our system, which had some sort of identifier, user story one, two, three, four. Um, and we used a, a branching naming convention, which tied every branch to a, a request, a business request. So we had user story one, two, three, four. We had a branch for that. It was, we tried to make it a one-to-one -one relationship. And we used a convention, very predictable naming convention, so that um, we knew exactly what branch went back to what user story. We could go back both ways. Um, everything in uh, the same sort of thing. We work locally, commit to origin, and then peer review based off of that with a pull request. Um, we had a QA branch here. And the QA branch is actually just another branch off of master. And when things were ready for uh, an engineer had developed and, and peer reviewed the code, it had been tested by them, um, then it got merged into QA and deployed to the QA environment where the business owner would test it and do acceptance there. Um, and once they've given the thumbs up, then that would get merged into master and deployed. Um, and so we would often refresh the QA branch so that it was always in sync with master. Uh, we, we do this frequently so that it was basically what we were testing is master plus the changes. And then we'd blow it away and create a new one for each thing. It, it was, it was um, we, we would do that quite often. Um, some of the pros and cons to this workflow, very similar to the GitHub example, um, it, it may not necessarily work at a very large scale. We had a pretty small team, and if we were to grow and grow and grow, more developers, more feature branches equal more merges and potential for conflict and delays and, and problems. Um, So, so there is that uh, consideration. One of, the, one of the definite pros that we gained from this um, was because we had a very uh, standard way of naming our branches, and we had branches e essentially equal a business request, a one-to-one -one relationship, we could actually do a lot of automation based off of that. And when the status in the ticket tracking system got approved by the business owner, we knew it was okay to merge and it was okay to move on. And so we could identify that, tie it into exactly what branch it was associated with, and we could actually do auto merging and, and so forth. Um, and if there were merge conflicts, we could know exactly who owned it and send emails back and say, hey, these were the merge conflicts, notify us, try to fix it, whatever. Um, so we, were, we relied heavily on automation and having these sort of standards helped us do that. Master only. Do people even do this? <laughs> I, I do, actually, with a couple of my clients. So um, in order to do this safely, you need an environment in which uh, you're developing that really is as close as possible to production so that you can trust what you're developing, what you're showing, what you're working on, um, and what you're going to just deploy is actually going to behave the same. So it, that's, that's something that actually you would need to do this safely. Um, changes are committed locally. Um, you need, in order to do that safely, you also need approval from the business owner. 
in there before you commit and push. So you'd need some way for them to access your dev environment um, before you push it out the door. Um, peer review, uh, there are a couple of ways of doing that in this type of workflow. Uh, one would be to share the same environment or give them access to your dev environment and say, hey, check it out here. It's on this server or, or uh, here, just you know, come on over and, and check this out. Um, another way would be actually to do feature branches and push to origin and then have them look at it locally like those other two workflows we've discussed. Um, but then when you get the approval, you just commit to, to master directly and, and uh, push. Um, pros and cons to this workflow. I think one of the obvious ones is, is extremely simple. Um, that you don't necessarily have to teach anyone this other than don't <laughs> branch, don't do you just, just commit. Um, some of the cons is, is I think also pretty apparent is this does not scale well at all. And, and you're, you really um, can introduce a lot of risk if you just allow everyone to just commit straight to master. Um, so something like this is really only meant for a, a very small team that you trust. Um, but it is a legitimate way to do it if that it fits your your needs and fits your uh, your process. Let's now talk about Git flow. Yeah. So on that last one, could one also say that that's the the flow that many open source projects take, where you have a few committers that commit directly to master, and the changes they receive come through an outside method such as email or whatnot. Um, potentially, but I, I would venture to say that that actually is different from this. Okay. So th even though they're committing to master, and if you look at the history, basically all you see is master and commits, but the workflow itself is different fundamentally because contributions and commits are coming from different means, okay. right? And, and basically what they're doing instead of commits is they're probably doing, um, like with GitHub, you do a, a pull request, and then you'd actually do a merge of, of someone else's branch, if that makes sense. So it, it is slightly different. Yeah. So Git flow. Um, Git flow depends primarily on long-running branches. And long-running, I mean that they basically stay uh, over time. They exist for a long time. So you have master, you have a release branch, and you have develop or development. Um, and primarily all work is done on the, off of the development branch. You branch off of that, do your feature, do your changes, and merge back into it. Um, at some point, the development branch is given the approval to be merged into a release branch. And that release branch is then what gets QA'd or gets sent to Jenkins for, Q for automated testing, et cetera, and prep for an actual deployment. That release branch, once it's given the green light, is then merged into master, and master is then pushed out to production and released. Um, the primary dif difference between these other workflows is that hot fixes are treated different than features. In the other workflows I've given you so far, an emergency uh, you know, hotfix to production is actually treated the same in the workflow as a, as a new feature. You just create a new branch off of master, you work on it, you merge it back in, you deploy it. In this case, a hotfix is branched off of master. That's the production code that has the bug. You branch off of it, do your fix, merge it back in so it gets out right away. But then only master has that fix. So you need to merge it back into your release branch and into production. So they are into development. So those also include your, your fix. Um, there are a lot of different implementations that vary with this. You may, if a, an organization or a team is using Git flow, they may actually have more than one release branch. Or they may have um, different branches that are, maybe have one over here called um, prep, or one over here called staging, or one over here, depending on uh, the environments that they're that they're using, um, but this is essentially the core of Git flow. 
Um, yeah. So could you maybe explain what's the purpose of the release branch? It looks unnecessary from my point of view. The release branch is to allow development to continue on. So you, you take a point in time of your developed branch and say, this is what we're going to release. We've met some sort of milestone, some sort of date. Everything needs to be committed by this date. And that's going into the release. But then developers just keep going on with the next set of features. And, and so you, you have the fork of that branch and say, OK, this is what we're going to release. We're going to QA that. We're going to get it ready. No other changes are coming in here unless they're you know, emergency you know, fixes. And then that's what gets released to production. Does that make sense? I think a lot of people kind of use that period to keep development open for just crazy new changes that may not be ready for release. But then when they do decide to do their release, it, they, uh, they mark that as the time that it merges into the release branch. But that's about the point that that branch starts to get all the work for API translations and any other last minute test changes and going through and do last minute testing. Yeah. Yeah, all this other work that's still going on, all these new crazy things that are happening in develop. Yeah. So you put the, a lot of times you have something you have to put in the, the like customize the scripts for the release that aren't going back. You just do them in there and then you just don't, don't lose them back. Like the version number for the release or, yeah. or, or, or a path that's specific or something like that. Yeah, so um, you mentioned versions of a release. So this workflow is designed for something where the release actually is meaningful. And, and it also recommends you use tagging. So I mentioned it up there. So you, you tag version numbers throughout this. And, and in fact, because there's a lot going on here, there's a lot of moving parts, there's actually some helper scripts out there. There's a, a version or a script actually called git flow, which helps you manage this workflow. Um, so yeah, if, if you're building something that uh, you're going to release a new version of Salt. That, that release version actually is meaningful to the end user. Say, I'm running this specific version, or this version of OpenSSH, or this version of the Linux kernel. That, that release actually is meaningful. So this is designed for that type of, of uh, workflow. It's not necessarily designed for a web app where the version doesn't matter. Um, some other uh, pros and cons to this one. Uh, this one, because it allows a lot of separation and a lot of flexibility, this one actually does scale well with large developers and, and teams. Um, because you can, ha ha like I said, you can separate exactly all this craziness that's happening further away from master and be able to merge things as, as they get accepted and are stable and only merge into master when things are are good to go. Um, some of the cons is the opposite. At a very, if you're a very small team, this may be too much overhead. So that's something to consider. I have a question that Tim had asked me. If I get a new official branch from develop, I'm getting whatever other developers have committed there, which means that I cannot if I finish my change, I cannot push that to to master until, or, or that will go with everybody else changes there. And that was a problem that we had. That, I mean, I had changes, for example, and other developers had committed the changes into develop, but they were not ready to to commit. And that's why it, we concluded that they need a lot of coordination in a large team. Yes. Because then you, you have bunch of pieces that people have been working in development, but maybe they are not ready. Are yes. And then you cannot move on. Yes. Yeah. So that is a risk, certainly. When when you're taking this whole branch, and at some point in time, you're taking the whole branch over. Right. Exactly. And and some Everybody some things ready. may be ready, and some things that are in there, uh -huh. maybe not. And so that's something that the business has to be aware of, and say that's the consequence of of this workflow is you're just taking everything. Oh, right, right. And. Everybody. And how you deal with that is, well, you maybe accept some risk. Or maybe you have a longer QA time to, to find those issues. Or anyway, it, it's a business decision. Right, right. Yeah, I, I found that we need to coordinate better that when, when somebody starts working in a piece, that 
we, we know that this is going to go on the next, next two weeks or whatever time, but if, if not, you are in that situation that you can now move on. Yeah. Even your thesis is there. Yeah, your, your, your release may be held up because there's something in there that shouldn't be. In this workflow, you would do it off the release branch. I mean, you would do definitely prep work before then. You do unit testing and so forth before it even goes into a release. Um, but yeah, you would do your primary regression and everything off of the release branch, saying this is what's going to go out soon. We need to iron everything out of it. So if you had a if you had an accidental commit into your release branch that wasn't ready to go, you would just um, overcommit it. Or yeah. It, you, you would you come up with some solution. And, and like I said, it's, it's a business decision at that point. Say, what do you do with that? Um, let's talk about the next example. So I worked at Backcountry, which used a, a workflow very similar to Gitflow. Um, however, you can see some of the differences from the diagram. We, we named things a little bit different. That was one difference. Um, we did all of our work off of master. Did all of our features and all of our craziness happened there. And then we went to a release branch. And then we went to another branch, which we just called production. Um, master doesn't have to be special. It could be just another branch. You could make something and name it whatever you want to name it and have that be your production-worthy code. So just the fact that we're master, Yeah, yeah. Um, so another difference is that we did hot fixes and releases off of the same thing. And everything went through the same merge workflow. Instead of having to merge back, we just decided let's hotfix here and then have an expedited process to get that out. Um, we also worked on a, on a fragmented release schedule. We, were supposed, we had weekly releases at Bad Country. Every Thursday morning, we released. But because of this. Um, potential for hot fixes and so forth, we had what I mentioned, a different workflow, which we called emergency releases, which happened almost daily. But, uh, um, but it, it allowed for that. Um, you mentioned about things that may be in your development area, your master branch, your development branch, whatever you call it, that may not be ready to merge all the way over. The way the backcountry chose to solve that is with, with a lot of use of cherry pick saying, I want just these commits and not the whole thing to merge. Cherry pick has its place, but I think this was probably a poor choice um, to use it that much, because then your Git history really gets divergent using too much of cherry pick, because your, the Git history of this branch is quite different from what's actually in production. And there's a risk there having things be so different. That makes sense. Um, what's the between production and release in this? So, so release, you, you don't have a question, then what, what's on production? So release is what we QA'd. We prepped before we released. Does that make sense? Production is what got out released to the real world. <coughs> so we would do development here, get it ready, uh, do our unit test, whatever, say, OK, uh, we'd actually have uh, business owners accept it here, too. We'd have them doubly accept it. Say, OK, it's good to go to QA. We merge it into a release branch, push that to QA, have them test again, say, OK, this is basically just my changes, just what's going out now. Make sure it's OK, OK, push it out. Regression testing. Regression testing. We used merges and, and cherry picks. Um, yeah, like I said, I think there were quite a few things that um, I think if I were to go back, I could improve on. And, but I think it, it worked at the time for the use case. It was a successful flow. Um, so there are a lot more workflows we could talk about, but I hope this gives you some ideas of differences, and some ideas about uh, what to consider for your workflow, and maybe to question your workflow. 
Um, so let's get into some guidelines, maybe what you can think about. Um, use branches, but use them in a smart way. Use them to tie a single releasable request from the business. Now, I use business throughout this presentation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're working for a business with this workflow. You could be working on an open source project. You could be just yourself. Um, but there's someone who comes up with ideas, comes up with requests, and prioritizes those. And once it's developed, approves them, saying they're good enough for release. And once they're out, makes sure that it actually works the way it's supposed to. Um, and so when I say business owner, that's what I'm talking about, is whatever that person is in your um, workflow. So use branches. Um, use them in a way that they can be released as a single unit. So this is what's in this branch. It contains just this request and nothing else because it really simplifies from a business owner to say, I give this one an OK to, to go out. Say, oh, all right, let's merge this and, and deploy it. And there's no extra baggage. They say, oh, well, it's actually got this other code in it too, and that's not really ready. And so try to separate that out. Avoid long-running branches. The longer a branch continues on to exist, over time, the further divergent it will be from what it branched off of. And by the time you merge it back in, the more potential there is for merge conflicts and risk. So in creating your request and, and developing what uh, is going to inc be included in a feature or in a feature branch, it really is best to make them shorter, smaller deliverables. And that really simplifies your merge back in and, and reduces your risk. Now, there are many times where, you, you, by design, you just have to have a long-running branch. And, and that's perfectly fine, but you need to be aware that you'll need to be bringing uh, your code, your master code, back in to get it updated with most current stuff. And that ne can't, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is overhead and can potentially delay you if things, oh, well, I just merged in master, and now I've got all these conflicts, and I have to spend you know, more time resolving that. Anyway, it, it, it's overhead that can be avoided if you are trying to do shorter deliverable branches. Business, business uh, owner involvement is essential. And I hope I've given you several uh, points and examples about this to think about. That your workflow impacts more than just the developers. So think about and try and engage them in a way, or at least um, have the, the business owner involvement inform how you do things, how you move from one thing to another, how you branch, how you merge, how you get to final a release, et cetera or if you release something that wasn't supposed to be released, bad things happen. <laughs> Avoid reverts where possible. Git really makes it easy to branch and to merge and even to revert. But that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's a good thing. <laughs> if you look at your Git history and you see lots of reverts, it really makes you confused. I don't know if you've experienced this. Say no. If it happens often, then that means something in your workflow needs to be changed. When you do merge and you feel like, oh, crap, we need to revert that, I, I strongly recommend always using no fast forward. And you do that git merge dash dash no ff. This at least makes it easier to revert a merge. It still is one thing that I kind of hold my breath and cross my fingers that everything worked out OK. But at least it makes it easier to do that. Uh, is everyone familiar with what this concept is, what I mean by no fast forward or fast forward? OK, I, uh, so fast forward, a fast forward uh, merge is basically when you have your, your, let's call it your master branch, 
and you've branched that off and added some commits. Basically, when you merge that back in, there's actually nothing new off of where you branched off. There are no other commits yet. And so when you merge that in, it can actually just lay on top. And your Git history will show just a, a single line of commits. That's called a fast forward. When you have your master and you branch off, but yet other commits have happened since then, now it has to consider those. And, and it creates what's called a merge commit. And it brings those two back together. Does that make sense? Um, when you're in a case where there is no, where you've branched off and there are no other commits and you're going to merge back in, if you do a no fast forward, you're basically telling Git, always create a Git commit. Even though it could be fast forwarded, create a Git commit. And what a Git commit does, if you look at the Git history, it actually shows the hash strings for both parents of that commit. So you can see the original and the, the feature branch that got merged in. And that allows you to identify easily the root of that merge, of where they got branched before you merge them back in. Yeah? So, that's the, so if you do it, so, so in the case where it would have fast forwarded but doesn't, it's like the, the end of the feature and the original, and, and went back to the it started out as, or it becomes a two? Feature. Yeah, so it, it, it basically gives you the hash string of where you were before in the Git history. So you can skip all those different commits and go back to where it was before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so how often do you guys release? And that really should inform your workflow. Are you doing something that, that uh, has a very set scheduled release cycle? You're Ubuntu and you're releasing every six months then that should inform your workflow. If you are GitHub and you're releasing 10 times a day, that should inform and shape your workflow. Um, also, how does your release process work? Do, do your developers release? Or do you actually have to hand something off and your operations team are the only ones that release? Or is it an automated thing that you trigger a job through Jenkins and it does something? That should inform your workflow, things to consider. Um, and that your workflow should make it easier to release. Make your workflow simple. Um, things that are complex are hard to keep in your head. And especially if you're trying to bring in new people new hires or bringing new developers to your open source project. And if you have a complicated workflow, there's going to be a learning curve to get up to speed. Um, trying to keep things simple makes it easier for people to adopt, easier to maintain in the long run, et cetera. Um, let me reference my notes. So there, oh, hold on, lost my place. So your workflow is made up of business decisions. And uh, your branching strategy, your branching naming strategy, um, your release frequency, those are actually business decisions. Do you have a ticket tracking system and do you care that you name your branch a certain way to map it up. Some people may not care, uh, but some may. And think about those things because they will um, ultimately in fact impact your release process. And the, your workflow is um, just a part of a bigger picture. Right. Yeah. This is something that I came across about a year and a half, two years ago, the first time, and I didn't realize that things were set up this way. But um, packages like Redmine, um, packages like uh, Jira. Mm -hmm. if, if you name your commits by starting with the identifier of the issue, mm -hmm. it will hook them together. Yeah. So our developers, for example, could be inside of Jira doing their thing, and it will list the commits relevant to that thing they're working on. And it really speeds up the process. QA and dev now have a single quick way to get back and forth, and they, can, they have a, a common vocabulary. 
Yeah, and, and, and you, you hit on a key thing, that, that more than developers can access that. So your QA team and, and even business owners who initiated that request are all talking on the same level. So that's key. Uh, so your, your Git workflow is just a, a, a piece of this larger process we call software development, the software development life cycle. And it's often described and categorized in this way, a development process, a deployment process, a, maintain, a maintenance process. But I think this is a one-sided view, one-sided categorization of this. There are more things involved here. Um, so at some point, there's some initial planning, discussion, ideas, formulating requirements, prioritizing those according to your timelines, your budgets, your, your constraints of, of how many people you have to work on, to work on your projects, et cetera. Um, the core development itself, the business acceptance, at some point there's going to be a, a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if this is okay, if it's met the requirements. Uh, the deployment process, releasing things out, but once it's deployed, there's an evaluation stage which says, did we accomplish our original objectives? Did this actually succeed in fixing the bug or does it Anyway, there's a yay or nay there once it's in production and released. Many times people rely um, on their automated testing to verify that, uh, that we didn't break anything, no re you know, regression testing. But there's also this case of did we succeed in what we were trying to do. Uh, and maintenance, continuing ongoing monitoring, um, scalability, reliability of the, of the application of the software, um, and ongoing development. So. Throughout this, I hope I've, I've hit on a few of these and emphasized that these actually impact your workflow and they're things to consider as well. And as you're asking your question, what's best for my team? And is what we're doing right now actually helping in some way to make this easier? Because ultimately what's going to work is when more than just developers are being helped by your workflow. I mentioned earlier the purpose is to help people, and that includes everyone that's responsible for the software. There's a lot more we can talk about, and we're out of time, but there are a bunch of links that I've listed here. There are many more. I think these were great, um, so I've listed them out. Uh, on the conference website, there are links to my slides, so you can access all this. So let's give out some prizes. No. No. So I have um, two books and a box of Girl Scout cookies to give away. <laughs> they are Thin Mints. So. Um, <laughs> okay. Whoops. Oops. Yeah. Hurry. <laughs> Anyone who hasn't put their name in, do it now. Hold it in half or just... Yeah, whatever. Okay. I'm going to ask for a helper, so we do this as fair as possible. Would you mind coming up? I'm going to dump these on the table. I could just... Oh, that didn't really spread them out. <laughs> I need a bigger container. Let me, let me show them back in here. I'll just do a blind thing. Close your eyes and pick one out of the cup. Jose M? Hey. Yeah. Okay. This is for Garrett Ney. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, come on, let's let's really mix this up if we can. Okay, for the thin mints. John Thompson. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody.